Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll wait a minute or two just till we get some more people joining. We've got 95 people signed up for tonight, so we're, I think we've got 25 people in the room just now. So we'll maybe give a minute or two before we start. Thanks, everyone, for joining so promptly. I've got a dog joining me here. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. I get thanks again for joining our second Harbro Equestrian webinar. Um, we've got three speakers for you tonight. I uh, hope you'll find them all very informative, uh, something for everyone. We've got Vicky Glasgow from Harbro, who will start tonight with some spring summer nutrition for your horses. Uh, Mark Gwynn from Zoetis Animal Health, who will join us and give us an up-to-date talk on spring, summer warming turnout time for your horses. And we've got Gillian Watt from And Breathe 123, who will give us a big informative talk, which we will all learn something from, I'm very sure. So I'll pass over to Vicky. Um, but before I do, um, if anyone has any questions from our speakers during the night, if you pop them into the chat box and then we will ask them at the end. Um, I think Gillian's going to try and be a bit more interactive with with you. So if you have any questions at the time for Gillian, if you pop those in the chat and we'll try and ask them as, as we go through her presentation. But um, I'd like to pass on to Vicky to start tonight's talks. Thank you. Hey, hi, everybody. If you just bear with me, so I get my presentation up. Okay, so I guess if you look out your window and you've been out there today, it's kind of hard to imagine that we're needing to be concerned with spring yet, but it will come back and it probably will go as quickly as it left. So Basically, this evening, I'm going to give a brief overview of some common scenarios we could expect at this time of year, including touching on the topic of laminitis. Although I apologise in this instance, I'm not going to be going into any great depth as it's a whole um, seminar on its own, but I will touch on the topic. Okay. So at this time of year is really a transition time, so they're changing from winter into spring. And it's a time of change for everybody and all animals. And the biggest change is that the grass starts to grow rapidly. It goes into a rapid growth phase. Ponies and horses generally get more turnout time. Exercise increases in working horses. And there's more reliance on grass and less on conserved forage such as hay or haylage. And all this means that basically nutritional needs and management should also change. So there's a few points to consider at this time of year. If you're looking at working horses, you need to get your starting point. So we should be looking at the condition your horse is in, so body condition scoring, its current fitness level, and then from there you've got an end point. What's the level of work you're aiming for this year? And make sure that it's fit for the purpose for which it's intended. There's no point in having your horse fit enough to do a four star event if um, generally you're just going to be doing a bit of hacking or some sort of local level competitions. So all that needs to be taken into account. The type of horse you've got, they're all different. There's laid back ones, there's fizzy, there's some that are a combination of both. And from that, you need to work out what kind of energy sources you might want to use for your horse to make them be the best that they can be. And then of course, there's a the management. We need to look at managing grass um, especially if we've got horses that are prone to laminitis or gut upsets, etc. So these are all things that we need to consider as we go into sort of competition season, summer season. So quick word on body condition scoring, which I've, you'll notice I've scored out body condition and replace it with fat scoring, because this is what we're really doing when we're um, body condition scoring. We're actually 
scoring the amount of fat that the horse has. And it, you, I'm sure you're all aware of the six main points of which we use to body condition score a horse. But basically, the horse gets split into three. This part, the, the front end, the middle, and the back end. And we basically score, fat score each of these areas. Now there's, um, there's the pen. There's lots of um, ways that you can learn to fat score. It's not so easy at the minute to get sort of hands on with other people, somebody like me teaching you how to do it. Um, although we have done those types of things in the past and hopefully we will be able to do again, but there's lots of online resources. So whether you use the zero to five or the one to nine um, range, um, you can find out how to do it online. There's people, places like um, World Health Welfare have a video on how to do it, Blue Cross, and there's probably many, many more, but it is possible. And the more you do it, the more confident you become. If possible, and especially at this time of year, and again, um, at the other end of the year, autumn, you should be really monitoring this weekly. And also listen to reliable sources as to the condition of your horse. So sometimes it's quite difficult if you're looking at a horse every day to realize that, oh, such and such is getting a bit fat or the other one's getting a bit thin. But people like your farrier are normally great for, um, if you've got a good, honest farrier who tell you, you know, your horse is looking a bit fat or your horse is looking a bit thin. Um, or a vet who only come in once every now and then and they'll be able to see if your horse is starting to look too fat, too thin. Um, weigh taping weekly is also a good idea, although sometimes it's maybe not 100% accurate, it does give you an indication of changes over time. So it will tell you if your horse is getting bigger or thinner. One thing you can't tell fatness, you can't tell by looking, because a horse can be nice and round through muscle, but a horse can be round through fat. But you can only tell by getting your fingers in and having a prod. And another thing to bear in mind is a snapshot weight will not tell you how fat your horse is. It will tell you what your horse weighs, but it will not tell you how fat your horse is. So just bear that one in mind. Um, getting a weight of your horse is great for worming, for knowing how much medication to give to them and for feeding as well. But in actual terms of how heavy should my horse be, um, each animal is gonna be different depending on how much muscle it stores and how much fat it stores. So as with humans, um, weight doesn't tell you the whole story. So just a little word of caution with that one. Okay. So common scenarios at this time of year. So things that I would tend to get asked about at this time of year is horses that have come out of the winter running up light. So that's a poor doer that needs a bit of building up. Mr. Average, I've called them. And these are the horses that tend to be the ones that are easier to look after. And, and they basically just need a good maintenance diet to keep them set, keep them looking how they already are. They've come out of winter looking near, next to near perfect. Then there's a good doer that's lost weight over the winter. So if anyone's got one of those, very well done. But they also need maintained but that's a lot tougher for them to maintain. So especially when the grass starts coming through, so it could be tough times ahead in the, ahead in the head of that little good doer. Um, and then there's the one that none of us want to see is a good doer that's gained weight over winter. Now it's gonna either be a companion animal that's needing a diet, or it's a horse that's gonna be expected to do some work and needs a diet for the work to come. And it's sadly got even tougher times ahead if we're gonna get this horse to lose some weight. So if you've got a horse that's running up light, it could be a competition horse, it could be an older horse, um, you're looking to really provide some energy without fizz. So especially if you're going and doing fitting work and you're not up into full competition mode yet, you need controlled energy. You don't want your horse full of beans and um, running around the countryside. So we're looking for what we call slow release energy sources. So we're looking for feeds with high oil levels, nice high digestible fiber sources like sugar beet, alfalfa, dried grass. And that sort of thing can be provided through a good quality conditioning cube, or um, you can go down the route of a balancer plus a high spec chop, whichever your preference is. Dr. Green um, should be managed so the horse gets leafy, not stemmy grass. So if you can do sort of rotation around paddocks for these types of horses and that's the ideal way to do it. However, these animals also need their grazing managed and limited in the spring because quite a lot of more thoroughbred and warm blood type horses suffer from 
colic, upset tummies, um, aggravation of ulcers due to um, the fast growing grass, the different type of grass that it is at this time of year. So in actual fact, it's actually a good idea to manage and limit the grass of all horses in the spring. Most of them can't cope with it, whether it's through gut, laminitis, or just the fact that it sends them nuts. Um, always a good idea to continue feeding hay because it keeps their diet more consistent. Um, the other thing that can happen is once you've gotten through the fitting, they're likely to have increased work levels. So as that work intensity increases, you might have to consider changing the type of feed to more fast release types of diets, especially for jumping and eventing. The more fast release diets tend to be coarse mix type feeds. So there's more starch in there, which is more of a fast release type product. So good old Mr. Average. So he's basically needing to maintain his current weight and energy levels as his exercise increases. So in the main, a good quality, high oil, high fiber, or some pony nut or mix is about perfect for the job. Um, nuts generally contain less cereals than mix, so it gives less fizz. Um, so if you're needing to pep something up, you would give it a coarse mix. If not, feed it on a nut. Um, as the grass becomes available, they might not need any extra feed. Maybe that you get away with um, just a low spec chop and a good quality vitamin and mineral supplement. There's lots of horses get through to up to medium level of work on just a good quality vitamin and mineral supplement. Go on, don't wait. If work increases and the horse needs more energy, move to a higher spec diet or, as I say, select a coarse mix instead. And the other option, as with the ones that's running at light, is to use a balance or pellet with a medium energy chaff. So you've got the flexibility to go backwards and forwards with your balance or pellet as your base diet and whichever chop you've decided to use. And you've got the flexibility to add and take away oil, oats, beet pulp, whichever is most appropriate for the way your horse is feeling and looking. So the next one is your good doer's maintenance. So plan with these ones is to keep the winter condition loss off. So they have a requirement for fiber, vitamins, protein, and water. We're talking about basically maintenance plus a little bit extra for work. Um, they definitely need their grazing managed. Quite often you'll need to soak hay to just get take some of the sugars out, especially during the spring flush. And a low energy chaff plus a vitamin and mineral supplement or an appropriate balancer is just about probably what most of these guys will need. Um, it doesn't have to be any fancier than that. If you're needing to get some extra oomph into them, that is quite often can be achieved with just a handful of oats or a handful of coarse mix. Um, have that in there all the time so their guts are used to it. And then if you've got a big competition or a big training session, you can give them a couple of handfuls uh, or something extra the day before and throughout the training session. So um, that's a good tip for them. So sadly, we have an increase, increasingly obese equine population and, and the reasons why are many. Modern horse keeping is actually not great for some of our equine friends. We've got sugar rich grass species and clover rich swords that were grown for cattle who are growing and producing milk. Horses work less, if at all. Um, there is a high degree of overfeeding, um, sort of, mm, misplaced um, feeling that you're doing the right by the horse but in actual fact overfeeding can just cause many many problems. Over rugging there's been more and more um, comments on this and I, when I first started doing these talks many 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 years ago um, over rugging wasn't really mentioned much but there's it's just people seem to be becoming more and more aware which is great. Um, native ponies should not need rugged in the winter unless it's really, really foul, wet rain, and there's no um, shelter. But generally speaking, they shouldn't need a rug at all. Horses are not allowed to lose weight over the winter. So people don't like to see their horses losing weight. So they'll gradually get fatter and fatter as we feed them more and more. Um, it's natural for horses to lose weight over winter, and we should allow them to do that. But it's just getting your head in that, in that zone, really. Um, yeah, and this generally makes for a generally fatter population. So equine metabolic syndrome, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, or EMS, is basically a syndrome of obesity, insulin resistance, and laminitis. 
So a picture there showing you the classic laminitis stands with a cresty neck and dimpled fat on the quarters. That's a classic um, EMS horse. Fact about laminitis, the cause is still not fully understood. Even now when we've been dealing with it for decades, it's still, research is still ongoing. We have more of an understanding nowadays, but we're still not there. It's basically a local manifestation of a body-wide metabolic breakdown. There's lots of factors coming into play. There's over 8,000 cases annually in the UK, which is about 7.1% of the population. Although I'm sure that's actually higher than that. That's just what's recorded by the vets. The majority of cases obviously occur in animals out of pasture. So they reckon 61% of animals are at grass, 30% are kept grass and stabled, and 9% are stabled. So yes, they can get laminitis in a stable. Obese animals are at greater risk, that we know. And there are more of these obese horses in the population. And it's not just a disease of fat ponies. So the equine metabolic syndrome horse basically will have abnormal fat pads. Even when thin ribs can be seen, they'll tend to have a cresty neck, the dimpled fat over the quarters and various parts of the bodies, and quite pronounced tail head fat are normally key indicators of a horse that's got equine metabolic syndrome. So if you have a horsey like that, it looks like this, struggling to get these fat pads off, do ask the vet to come and test them because the sooner you do something about it and get them onto the right kind of diet and or medication, better. These horses are basically on a metabolic knife edge. So even if they're thin, but they've got all this going on and their hormones have um, gone all to pot, it will take the tiniest thing, even just one day of escaping into the good grass or a hot day that takes you by surprise and the grass suddenly shoots. Just an hour of that, if they're on that metabolic knife edge, can affect them. So mental fat, which is basically the fact that fat is not benign, it does things. Some fat produces its own hormones, and one of those is cortisol. And cortisol interferes with the action of insulin. And what that does is it stops glucose from being moved into cells. And what we notice is, apart from the fat pads and everything, the horse will actually become lacking in energy. More fat equals more cortisol, which means even more insulin re re released. So we tend to get this insulin resistance or dysregulation. Um, and it can really be compared to diabetes type 2 in humans. It's that same type of thing. And insulin will interfere with circulation in the body. So that's why um, the horses see it in the feet, because the circulation goes completely wrong. Um, and that is basically what, how insulin resistance manifests itself. So if you're feeding a beast horse, obviously it's diet time. Um, weight reduction is a must. So how, how do we do that? What's the best way to, to put a horse on a diet? We don't want to just suddenly starve them. So the best way to do it is to obviously limit or even eliminate pasture is the best way in the short term because it is just a source of uncontrolled calories. Diet solely with soaked hay is the main food. Start with 2.5% of current body weight, gradually reduce to 1.5% of current body weight, and then further reduce to 1.5% of ideal body weight. So you're doing this gradually. You're not just suddenly starving them. Um, this could take up to six months. And exercise is so crucial, um, even if it's um, just walking around, giving them more space to exercise in the field. It improves insulin sensitivity for as long as 24 hours after a bout of exercise. So it really, really is crucial. So briefly feeding the equine metabolic syndrome horse, we should be looking at limiting starch and sugars in the diet, keep those as low as possible. Fiber, ensure they're getting a minimum of that one and a half percent of body weight. Soak hay for minimum four hours to leach out sugars and reduce calories. Use a low calorie, no molasses chaff. No cereals or coarse mixes. High fibre, high oil feeds only. Obviously, restrict grazing. Make sure you've got a source of quality protein in there, whether it's from something like soya or amino acids. Um, those will appear as lysine and methionine. A good broad spectrum of vitamin and mineral supplement to make sure they're getting all the vitamins that they need, because they actually do need some vitamins to mobilise fat. So you should definitely make sure they're on a broad spectrum of vitamin and mineral supplement. 
Antioxidants are important. They're fighting inflammation in their body. Vitamin E and selenium are really important. A yeast supplement for hindgut bugs. Keep them stable. And exercise, exercise, exercise. So crucial. If the horse is working hard or losing condition, use oil or a super fibre to get the condition back on. So what is the trouble with grass? And this goes for all horses. This isn't just for your laminitics and your... Um, EMS horses. In spring and summer, there's just rather a lot of it about. Greedy animals can eat a lot in a short time. You'd be surprised at how much grass a pony can put away in a few hours. Nutritional quality can change markedly from week to week, even hour to hour, with nothing apparent to the human eye. We can't tell by looking at it how sugary or not it is. Clover actually stores starch when cold stress. So clover is a nightmare in horse grass and it takes over and we really don't want it in there if it can be helped. Um, quite often the swards are high sugar grass species, so if you've got the opportunity to change your sward over to low sugar grass species, then do so. Stressed grass will be high in sugars. Um, colic, grass sickness and general gut dysbiosis can be caused by these sort of uncontrolled and unseen changes in grass. And obviously laminitis. So grazing options for all horses in spring, what can we do to manage? So there's different options and, and some of you have used some, some of you wouldn't have used others. So there's zero grazing. So that's basically a, an all weather turnout area or or big bar, running barn. Limited turnout, so a few hours a day. A small overgrazed paddock is an option. So it's basically nearly down to the air. Three to four horses per acre, not one horse, which is what it says in the PC manual and BHS. That, for horses that are fat and in spring, do not do that. Uh, strip grazing is great because um, you can give them a little bit of grass, but but not too much at a time. But one thing I will say about strip grazing is beware and make sure that you have a, a line behind them as well. Because if you just keep advancing the tape and you're leaving all the space behind you, that that stuff at the back that they're not eating anymore is now growing and it's that short sugary grass so it is ideal especially in the spring to have two lines if um, that makes sense and then a racetrack type design is becoming more and more common again um that's a great thing uh, when i first started speaking about racetracks not many people knew what that was um but more and more people are using them and it seems to work because you get the added bonus of exercising your horses at the same time as restricting their grazing. Muzzle in combination with any of the above. I personally like muzzles because it means that the horses can be out with all their friends and they can be out in a bit more grass and still be moving around. Um, they are actually a godsend for some horses. They couldn't actually get out to grass at all if the muzzle didn't exist. If you have too much grass, get sheep in, get some other kind of animal in to eat some for you, cut the grass yourself, or turn some of it into a sand slash bark. Yeah, so those are all options for grazing. So a few warnings and myths. Only fat ponies get laminitis is quite probably not true. I can feed as much as I like of a laminitis trust approved feed to a laminitic. Also not true. Um, just because it has laminitis trust stamp on it doesn't mean that you can just feed more of it. It's there to help you to have something to feed them instead of grass, instead of sugary hay, instead of um, a feed to put supplements into. A laminitis supplement means my horse can freely graze and be safe. Again, not true. You still have to manage the laminitis supplement is not a silver silver bullet is not going to cure laminitis and um, so you still need to be wary um, and there's a lot of laminitis supplements out there which there's been very little scientific studies done on so again be careful. A bran mash is perfect for my EMS horse and um, a lot of people fall into the trap that think that bran mash is a source of fibre and therefore it must be good for fat ponies or EMS horses but actually Wheat bran, which is what bran mash is made out of, is actually still really very high in starch, so one to be avoided. And only fat ponies need their grazing restricted, as I was speaking about earlier. Some non-fat horses and ponies could do with their grazing restricted, especially in the spring. 
um, due to worries about colic, grass sickness, um, just a general gut upset. Okay. So in summary, know your starting point and where you want to be. Um, so you're going through a fitting period, you're trying to get your horse ready. Uh, it's good to know where you're starting and where you're finishing. Learn to fat score and monitor your horse's condition. That's a must. Um, like I say, plenty of online resources to, to learn how to do that skill. Select appropriate ener energy sources for work level and type of horse. So that's your slow release and fast release energy types. And laminitis is not just a fat pony disease and it is an emergency and you should always call your vet fire as soon as you suspect your horse or pony has laminitis. All horses grazing should be managed and restricted in the spring. And continue to feed hay all year round. This just stops the gut from getting upset and going into this sort of dysbiosis, which is just a posh word to say, out of balance. Um, it's also a known protectant for grass sickness. So I would encourage people to feed hay all year round. And um, people will say to me, but they won't eat the hay because they like the grass. Well, shut them away somewhere that they can't eat the grass and then they will eat the hay is the answer to that one. Manage grazing in a manner that encourages movement, if possible. So that's your rage track systems, um, or there's um, another system which is basically a radial system, and it works um, in the same sort of idea. You can Google that one. Um, muzzles are not evil or cruel. I know a lot of people don't like the idea of them, and your horse needs to be accustomed to it gradually, but they really are a godsend for some horses and ponies. Feed a good vitamin and mineral supplement to good doers. Um, because they still need their vitamins and minerals and in fact as I said previously um, if you want them to shift fat stores there are some trace elements that are key for that process and laminitis supplements will not substitute for good management and the main point exercise is crucial to managing metabolic diseases so thank you for that everybody thank you for listening and um, as I said, if there's any questions, if you put them in the um, chat boxes and um, we'll get to some of them at the end. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm now going to hand over to um, Mark Gwynn, who's going to talk to us about um, worming for the grazing season ahead. So I'll just get rid of me. Thank you, Mark. Lovely job, Vicky. Thank you very much indeed for that. Very informative. Please bear with me while I share my screens. <clears throat> Hopefully you can all see that uh, screen there. Um, what I'd like to do is take you through uh, some of worm control. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, as we all know, horses used to be wild animals, and then we domesticated them. And horses in the wild have evolved with parasites, believe it or not, part and parcel. And they established a balance which allows both to survive without really impacting dramatically on each other. But domesticating has ruined this balance. So in the wild, they would naturally move over large areas and where they picked up worms, they would pass out in their, their droppings and um, the horse would then move on so it wouldn't be in that area for a long time and they wouldn't be picking up as many worms. Now, because we, we confine them and keep them close together, they are always, or in a lot of cases, grazing near their, their um, dung piles. So just a little <coughs> excuse me, cap to make sure that um, everybody has treated their horses for encysted red worm. So the prevention and treatment of encysted red worm is aimed at stopping the larvae from encysting or um, in, in the gut wall of the animal and treat them as some possible after uh, they've become encysted. Timing of this dose is crucial and should be performed in late autumn, early winter, round about the end of November time, depending on the weather. If the dose is too early uh, and the weather's still mild, then they could reinfect themselves by picking up more larvae off the, off the grass, um, and, and these could then go on and insist themselves. For horses at high risk of developing cystomenosis and those showing signs potentially attributed to uh, a worm burden over winter, your vet may advise a second dose effective against this parasite in the spring. 
So treatment must be uh, very specific. Uh, only the active ingredients moxidectin and or a five day course of fembendazole are licensed and capable of killing these uh, insisted stages that are actually in the lining of the stomach. Unfortunately, we also know that there is a widespread resistance to fembendazole even at the five day course. Therefore, there is um, this drug is used for this purpose and it is first advisable that you check that is still effective in, in the population or on your, your um, yard or wherever you keep your horse. So we go on, the other one you need to consider this time of year is the small red worm is important, but also we mustn't forget the other parasites. So tapeworm have been reported in 69% of UK horses. They have a flat bodies and a range in segments that you can be seen here. So these little segments here, all of them potentially have um, eggs in them that can be passed on and picked up by another horse. They have a unique system that they have to go through the forage mite um, and then the horses pick up the forage mite either off the grass and to a lesser extent from hay and straw in, uh, that's used in stabled animals. Um, so tapeworms live in the junction of the small intestine and this is an area where it narrows between the two intestines and it can cause sometimes um, what they call spasmodic colic, where sometimes the horse is uh, uncomfortable with that and then it passes. And it's just because there's a blockage here, then it, the, it clears itself. You also get cramps. Um, and this is the, the, the horse itself trying to get rid of these parasites. So they need to be looked at and treated. So we will go on now and we will um, look at basically what we have here is, is a worming program and what I've done or we've done is split it into four stages to try and help you understand and look at all the different stages and they all work together um, to look at it. So we talked about managing, testing, making a good plan and then if all those things are correct then you need to look at um dosing certain horses in in the groups so this really fits in really nicely with uh, a lot of what uh, vicky was saying about the the grazing management and all the rest of it so basically once eggs pass into the droppings they then hatch into larval stages which then migrate onto the forage so they crawl up the grass they they they, they think they follow the sunlight so they crawl up to the top of the grass and this is obviously as the horse comes along it grazes it um, and then without knowing it then ingests it and, and the, the life cycle starts all over again with infected with worm larvae in the horse. So the very easy and, and way to do this is obviously removing the droppings is a tired and tested way to reduce the number of infected larvae that are available to develop on the grass and then reinfect the horse. So daily removal is the top, the gold standard. Um, and failing that, if too busy, too big an area, whatever the reasons is, um, you can't get the kids to do it. Um, daily removal, like I say, is ideal, but studies have shown that even twice weekly removal can dramatically reduce the number of larvae in the pasture. If you reduce the larvae in the pasture, they can't get into the horse, then the horse is not going to be able to suffer um, from larval infections and also produce um, further larvae to it infect the pasture. On there also is used biological uh, vacuum cleaners as they call them. This is known as mixed grazing where your horses would be grazing with sheep or cattle. Um, the, the, the good point about this is that if, if the sheep or the cattle eat any horse worms, they will be killed and they will not be able to complete their life cycle and reinfect the horses again. Likewise, any uh, worms from the cattle or the sheep that the horse eats will be killed so you'll also have a, a beneficial effect around the three different types of animal. The other one is uh, rest in the pasture and this is a recommendation that it's done for about three months. So this again works well with some of the suggestions that uh, Vicky made in her, her presentation. The other one here is it will work in a good dry summer combined harrowing with resting. So once the, you've grazed the, the paddock or the field you harrow it and that spreads out the dung, it, it dries out and the, the eggs are 
struggle to hatch and, and create the um, for the larvae to emerge. And if it's rested for three months, those larvae will emerge. There's nothing there to eat them, so they will die off and you get a reduction. The problem is we have you know a fairly wet climate, especially here in Scotland, and that is very only really works in dry summers. Don't overstock the paddocks. And what they mean by this, if you have a very small field, and this again is a slight contradiction of what Vicky was saying, you know, she's saying keep them tight so that they have limited grass available. You have to understand if you overstock the paddocks, then where the horses um, uh, dung and the dung piles are, then obviously lava will be very near to them. And that will be a high level of, of area where the pasture contamination can easily reinfect the horses. So you need to do that. Reduce the paddock size. The other going to the other step where people say, oh, it's too big a field to do this. So they're all over it. We, we struggle to pick up the the dung piles. Then if you reduce the size of the fields, you can create a rotation where you're able to rest the paddocks and move them around daily, weekly, whatever you like, into into a different part of the different different part of the um, paddock system. So fecal worm egg counts. This has uh, become very popular and is recognised <coughs> sorry <coughs> method of monitoring the parasite status of an individual horse and even a herd over time. So they measure the number of eggs passed or shed given in the indication of the worm burden inside the horse. Although there is not direct or absolute correlation, i.e. a horse with 400 eggs per gram um, found in its dung does not necessarily have less worms than one that passes out 500 eggs per gram. It, it is not an exact science. They may just produce more eggs from the adult uh, worms at that time when the sample was taken. So perhaps more importantly, fecal worm egg counts will indicate which horses are shedding the most eggs and therefore which animals are contributing most to the passive contamination. Interestingly, in any group of horses, approximately 20% of the horses in a group will produce about 80% of the pasture contamination from eggs being passed out in the, in, in the dung. These horses then are classed uh, or known as high shedders, with others being classed as medium or low shedders. Okay. Once a horse reaches around five years of age, they tend to stay constantly at either a low or a high shedders um, and that's just the are it doesn't necessarily say mean it will have an impact on the horse um, or the pony that is just what they are their their system their stomach the way they work their immune system dictates that they're either a low or a high shedder so by doing your fecal worm accounts you're able to work out which ones are your high shedders and which are your low shedders Egg shedding is important as it promotes the basis for the modern way of worming, which we, we, we now class as selective therapy. Treating only those that need worming also reduces the amount of pasture contamination. So moving on, like all tests, sadly it's not black and white, the fecal worm account is only an indication of what is happening at any one time and there are at some points to remember when these tests are interpreted. Okay. Firstly, the eggs may not be uniformly distributed throughout the droppings pile. <coughs> Excuse me. Pile, and the test is only able to detect the number of eggs that was in that particular sample. So sampling is very important about how you do it. For that reason, when collecting the sample, it is advisable to take a small amount of droppings from a number of different sites on that one pile uh, of droppings, okay? And then you mix them together to what they call a pooled sample. Second, worms themselves may lay more eggs at certain times of the day than others, with the number of eggs being different in each dropping pile. Thirdly, worms in some horses will produce more eggs even though they may have the same actual worm burdens. In addition, during the winter periods, when the larval stages are most common, um, fecal worm accounts may come back low or clear despite a high burden because they are 
the adults, oh, sorry, they're not at the adult stage and not laying eggs at that point. Following on from good pasture management and testing, we then use the information to build an effective plan. Okay, traditionally worming was performed at the same time with the same product for all horses on a yard using the information from previous slides. You can see that using this approach, some horses would be wormed unnecessarily. With the sampling, you're able to, to highlight your high shedders. When they have a low fecal egg count, or that some horses may require extra worming treatments because they are shedding more eggs, the high shedders, the aim therefore is to build a specific plan for your horse. All, the, all of this invasion then can be developed into a plan for when a horse should be dozed and when it should be tested. The approach is called selective therapy because it selects which horse to treat at each worming period and those which should not require treatment. Selective therapy is usually only considered to be suitable for adult horses, i.e. what we mean by that, horses over three years of age. And I will talk about foals in the next slide. The best thought is in two parts. First, First, add in the minimal required treatments per year because it can be difficult to distinguish between active and old tapeworm infected. The accepted way of dealing with tapeworm is to dose them twice a yearly. Um, in contrast to small redworm, they have very little suspected resistance to tapeworm. So the modern or the treatments that we are using are, are, are perfectly adequate to do the job for that. Dozing at the beginning and end of the grazing season helps to disrupt the six monthly life cycle of the parasite of the tapeworm. Remember, not all products treat tapeworms and they will require a specific type of wormer either on its own or you can get it in combination with the, the this broad spectrum wormer product. So you can, what we call a combination wormer. So what we're saying is you need a specific dose for insisted red worm to be added in the late autumn, early winter. And if you wanted to treat for the tapeworm as well, you can combine this and use a combined wormer at this time. The second part is to add in the fecal egg counts. Counts should be started from approximately the beginning of March and continued through to November. Currently, remember, P use a cutoff of approximately 200 eggs per gram when they get the results back. If it's showing that there's 200 eggs per gram as a level, of shedding that indicates a worming dose for small red worm is required. As also, the answer is not black and white, and all the history and clinical information should be taken into account to help you build a plan. Use this approach, many adult horses may only need two to three worming treatments a year. So, as I mentioned before, just a little brief part about the foals, but this please take additional advice from your uh, prescriber or, or your, your, um, your vet. The foals differ from adult horses because they have less of an immune uh, response to worms because in a lot of cases, this is the first time the foal's body has been exposed to these worms. And the potential here is also that the fatal large roundworms uh, at around six months of age. The main threat will gradually shift to small redworms Although the exact timing can be difficult uh, and changes with different populations and different animals. A fecal worm egg count can be used to identify which parasites are present, which is ideal to find out exactly what you're looking to treat. Because foals are more susceptible to the effect of the parasites and they can, they can um, create a, a disease problem very quickly, they breed very quickly they, and they multiply very quickly. Um, and become, they can change their egg shedding status very quickly. A selective therapy approach is usually not recommended. Instead, a rough rule of thumb worm often starts around two to three months of age and is continued at regular intervals throughout the first year of life so that they would probably have four to six worming doses are given. So the next one to consider is new horses. Hopefully some here this evening will uh, be hopefully get in a new horse for the spring. 
Um, and this is quite a crucial time of year because it will be very stressful for the horse uh, or pony that you're getting. And these changes and this stress will lead to them um, producing high levels and become what we call high shedders. And it's not necessarily going to be for the rest of their life. It's just going to be until they settle down in, in the new premises, in the new home, in amongst the new horses. So the other thing you consider that 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 the horse that you bought and the pony you bought might contain resistant strains of worms in it. So you don't want those infecting and going on to your pasture. So what the recommendation is quarantine on arrival. Um, at this point, it would be quite good to do a fecal worm egg count. So it gives you a baseline to know what level um, the horse arrived at. And then quarantine treat new horses and treat them with moxidectin and prazicanto. This will deal with all your worms and it will also deal with any tape worms that they may have arrived at uh, the yard with. So from this, just in the summary, like I say, clear, clear the droppings at least twice weekly, ideal gold standard every day. Do a fecal worm egg count every two to three months, starting March, April time, just about now. Use selective therapy in adults. Plan appropriately for foals and young horses. Review your plan annually. You know, it's good to do it this time of year or maybe in the autumn annually. And seek advice from your prescriber. Um, I would like to reach out here to, to um, all the members of Harbro that are what they call Ramas, registered animal health medicine advisors. advisors. They have had to sit an exam and they have to continually um, attend training courses to keep them up to speed with any changes on these things. So don't think it's something you've got to create on your own. There are experts, highly qualified people out there that can help you create a plan and guide you along your way. You can also speak to your, your, your vet, of course, um, as well with these things here. The next thing I'd like to show you is just a little um, slide. This is um, a site we have called Horse Dialogue. And um, well, I'll just let it play and, and you'll you'll see what it what it is. So that's it. It's horse dialogue. You can find it on Facebook, Twitter, or you can go to the website. There's some really interesting articles. Um, it's had a lot of hits lately with all this um, outbreak of the herpes virus, um, and that's it. So thank you very much. Um, like I say, I work for Zoetis, and we are the, the makers of Equest and Equest Promox. And just for anybody who's concerned, this is where we've taken our um, guidance from in this presentation this evening. So thank you very much for your time. And now I would like to hand over to Gillian, who's going to take us through some life-changing experiences, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Hi, um, I'm Gillian. I'm from And Breathe 123. And I am about, I hope, to um, share the presentation with you. Lovely to be here tonight. Just right, there we go, from the beginning. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Julian Watt. I work as Anne Breed 123. I'm a qualified EFT, also known as tapping practitioner, a mindfulness practitioner, and a Reiki level two practitioner, working as much as possible in the, um, the outdoors. So I support mental health and well being in all beings, humans, and uh, or, uh, animals as well mainly dogs and horses. So Anne Breathe 123 Cam Rider supports the equine community by sharing tools that can be used in your day-to-day -day life and also for specific situations um, that are where um, maybe situations that are affecting the, the relationship between horse and rider. This evening, I'm going to introduce you to some mindfulness and EFT, sharing with you how they link with the equine world. 
So mindfulness, what's mindfulness? It's an umbrella term that's being sort of thrown around at the moment. Um, really, all mindfulness is, is being in the moment, being present, noticing where you are and what you're doing. Um, and you might think, oh, we do that all the time. But for many of us, we are thinking about an awful lot of other things at the same time. So I mean, looking at the, the lovely photo on the right there, you know, that, that rider might well be sitting there completely at, at one with her horse, completely in the moment. But she could also be planning um, her dinner, what she had yesterday, what's happening tomorrow, um, thinking about a phone call she has to make. And that's where training in mindfulness brings us right back. So we can learn to switch off from that chattering brain of ours. It basically en enables us to respond rather than react in challenging situations. It gives us a bit of a buffer, a bit of space in situations where we might often react. Um, and that gives us time to respond instead. And one of the ways that we can do that is to regularly practice mindful breathing, which we're going to do in a minute. Um, we can train our mind to change our brain. And with the development of neuroscience, a lot of the research it sort of it backs up all of this. Um, the more we practice mindfulness and build the new neural pathways, um, the stronger those pathways become. And the old neural pathways, the old habits, maybe the not so good habits, they wither away. And we all know working with animals that if you're not in the moment, if, you're, if you get distracted, that's kind of when things happen. So we're going to practice breathing just for a minute. I'm very aware of the time. Um, so we'll just take a few breaths, but put, get hands free, literally. Um, pens, pencils, phones down or whatever, two feet in the floor. We're just going to do a few breaths of this, but feel your feet flat on the floor and really feel what that feels like. The ground's there holding you up and sit in an alert position away from the back of the, the chair in an alert but upright position. Bring your chin ever so slightly down to your chest. And if you want, you can close your eyes. I always close my eyes because it cuts out distractions. And all we're going to do is just notice our breath. Notice how your body feels when you breathe in. And breathe out. And we'll just do this for a few breaths. And every time the thoughts pop in like, oh, when's she going to stop this? Or what? I need, I've got things to do. I need to go. Just let those thoughts go for a moment and just come to the breath. Breathing in and breathing out. And the practice is that that chattering brain will continue. And the practice is that you continue to let the thoughts get blown away by the north wind and come back to the breath. So that is the beginning of learning how to be in the moment. And we use our breath because hopefully it's always there. So it's something handy that we can use just to anchor us in. Um, so I could go on about this for a long time, but I want to get to the end of the presentation. Um, so practice just a couple of minutes here and there of that breathing. Mindfulness and practice, you know, we've all We've all had mindful moments when we've been with our horse, that magic moment when you have been at one and it's felt amazing. But when we practice mindfulness, we can actually consciously choose to have more of those moments. So EFT, what's EFT? EFT is emotional freedom techniques with an S at the end because there's a few different kinds. It's also known as tapping, and it's a practical self-help method that involves using the fingers to gently tap on the body's acupuncture points along the meridian lines of Chinese medicine. And what we do is that help, EFT helps us to tune in to the negative patterns that we form around dif different things, um, uncomfortable thoughts or feelings or memories that are tricky. Um, we tap on the correct pressure points 
while bringing those thoughts into our consciousness. And the aim is really to find, get relief from that. It basically dissolves all the stuff, all the stuff that we hold on. Um, for example, you know, you've had a, a bad day, a bad night, didn't sleep, and you see somebody and they ask how you are, and you go, I'm fine. And we know what that means. There's a lot going on. And tapping gets rid of all of that. It dissolves it all. Um, there's been a lot. It's, it is very new, uh, relatively speaking. There's been a lot of science done now, and really the results are coming in kind of in an exponential curve. Um, this is one that uh, a study that came out just last year. Um, it was a follow on study from a study that was done back in 2012. Um, this was conducted by um, Peter Stapleton at Bond University in Australia. And with group tapping, that was a number of people together tapping together. Um, it, they found that it reduced the cortisol levels. We're back with cortisol, mentioned earlier tonight as well. Um, but this time it's in us, which is a stress hormone. So it reduces cortisol by 43%. Um, the other two groups were using other psychoeducation methods and they, their stress levels, the cortisol level went down 19%. And those who went, were given magazines to learn more about what they were doing went up 2%. So the, the science is coming in um, and that's it's good to know. So I wanted to get to this part because where does EFT fit in? One of the biggest challenges many of us, the equestrians face, it's got nothing to do at all with mechanics of riding the horse or the competition. The battle is in the mind. And if we're calm and relaxed, we know that our horse responds to that just as we know that they react to our not so good grumpy days. And the science backs that up now because they're the, um, the results are in that horses can tell how we're feeling. Um, so if we can get rid of our rubbish, get rid of our fears, our worries, but if we get that out of the way, then we can better focus on what we're wanting to convey to our horses. For example, um, let's just looking at the, the horse and rider here. Let's say perhaps the last time they were on that cross-country course, they crashed out, they spooked, um, something happened. If you go in with that memory, that memory is hovering there. EFT will get rid of the emotion attached to that memory. You know it happened, but the emotion and the fear and the worry dissolves. And the results are very good within the equine world. Looking at the dressage arena, you know, the last time the horse wouldn't go down the centre line, something happened and you've got that memory. With EFT, we can um, tap on that and dissolve the anxiety and stress around it. So that's kind of how it works. Um, I'm very aware we're at eight o'clock. I would like to come out of sharing. I would like to come out of sharing, if that's okay, just for a minute, and I've got one more slide. I thought we would do a little bit of EFT just to let you have a shot, okay? So bear with me. Um, I don't see any of you, so you can feel quite comfortable in the safety of your own home. Um, with EFT, we always set ourselves the same sort of pattern in the kind of EFT I'm sharing with you. We always start, so you're gonna do this with me, okay? Just try it, have a bash. We tap the side of the hand, it's called the karate point, um, and we have a setup statement. So what we're going to do tonight, I'm just going to tap because it's helping me. Um, I want you to consider just for a moment, uh, any, have you got any aches or pains? Stiff neck, in fact, let's try that. If you want to try and turn your neck, one way and then the other and just see if there's any stiffness there. Um, if you've got a sore lower back, I know with different halt, it falls, bumps and things like that. 
just focus on an ache or pain that you have. And if you've tested your neck just now, just notice where that was, okay? And just two minutes, tapping the side here and say, even though, got a bit of a stiff neck. So you say it with me, it's the speaking along with the tapping that does it. I'm okay. And then we say it again, even though, feeling a bit stiff, a bit sore, and you can name whatever it is you're sore or stiff. And we always have a balanced statement. So I'm just using, um, I'm okay tonight. You can say, I love and accept myself. It's completely up to you. And then one more time, even though um, I've got an ache, I'm going to be okay. And then we go down the points. So we go up here, up to the crown, the temple, up the top here. Feeling a bit stiff. And then down to the top of the eye. This feels very odd doing this. Make sure you repeat after me. And then out to the side. It could be mumbo jumbo. And then underneath. But I've got a stiff neck. You feel the tension right there. And then down underneath the nose. It's sore. And you think about where it is that you're feeling it, okay? And then down here, it's stiff and sore. And then we go down to the collarbone. So the collarbone comes down here, ends around about there, and right under the knobby bit, that's a scientific term, there's a soft part, so just tap in there. Breathing as we go, good breaths. Feeling a bit stiff, a bit sore. And then take one hand, put it on your shoulder, and tap underneath your arm. If you're wearing a bra, that's where you tap. If not, imagine it. And just say, yeah, feeling a bit sore, a bit stiff. And tonight we're going to come back to this collarbone part. Breathing, a bit stiff and sore. Okay, and then breathe out. Now, we are only going to do one round because I'm very aware of the time. Um, but just take a moment, just turn your neck and just see if there's been any change. There might not. Um, I don't know. If Just check in with your sore bit. If you're feeling that the sore bit's a little bit better, then I would keep tapping. And you might sometimes find that the sore bit moves to another part. So it might have been the lower back. It might have traveled around to the side and we would follow that uncomfortable feeling. So that gives you a very, very small, short introduction to EFT. Um, as with all of our presentations tonight, we would love to talk a lot longer. Um, I'm going to go back to just share the last slide um, with you tonight. Hang on a sec. And here we go. Okay, and we're just going to come to the benefits. Um, what are the benefits of EFT and mindfulness? Well, it reduces, both of them reduces stress. It then increases your health. Mindfulness meditation boosts, boosts our immune system. And we're able to fight off illness, leaving us in a much better place. It increases our productivity. We can process emotions more effectively and increase our emotional stability, which is so useful when we're working with animals. Um, it improves our ability to concentrate. Again, so useful when we're out working with animals, working with others and so on. It also reduces our vulnerability to pain, which is helpful, and it improves our quality of sleep, improves the memory and slows down the aging process, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and basically, most of importantly for me with Cam Rider, it enables us to overcome historical negative memories 
to kind of free us up to really enjoy our horse and enjoy the moment. So that's um, more or less it in a nutshell. I'm going to stop sharing. I'll come out of that just now. Um, and just to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I am running an online four week course just to kind of introduce people to it again. It starts on the 5th of May. Um, I give one to one appointments and also I'm open to workshops if maybe a, a riding club or a riding stables wants to come in, have me come in just to kind of go over things. It's useful, for example, if you're getting ready for competition just to use the mindfulness, but also the EFT to, to, manage, to manage your emotion and nerves. It helps to totally dissolve the, the nerves and anxiety of competition. It can leave you with a little bit of a zing to have the excitement of the competition, but it takes away the negative stuff. So I think that's me for now. Um, thank you. And I'm going to hand back to Kevin for a few question and answers, I think. So thank you. Thanks, Gillian. Uh, also, thanks to Vicky and Mark for their presentations. I'm hoping everyone found them very interesting and took something from each of them. Um, we've obviously run slightly over, so we'll keep a couple of questions, just quick, short questions. Uh, the ones that we don't answer, we will um, get back to you directly within the next couple of days with answers to your questions. Um, Tonight's presentation will also be available to view at a later date should you wish to go back or pass it on to any of your friends to have a look at as well. Um, so we'll start with a question for Vicky. Um, my horse suffers badly with ulcers. I can manage it well, but this time of year they can always flare up. Is this typical and how can I help prevent it? Okay, so that is one of the horses that I was speaking about that we always associate managing gra springtime grass with fat ponies, but in actual fact, the majority of horses and ponies need the grass managed at this time of year, just because the grass as it is, is full of sugars, it's full of highly fermentable carbohydrates, and that really does aggravate ulcers. And the best way to prevent that is to make sure they're still getting hay, which just to keep the bugs in the gut correct. And also, if you can feed a really good, which you're probably doing already, um, a good gut um, balancer with pre and probiotics in. Um, and it might be that he just can't handle any grass at all. So you really do just need to look at where you can, limiting the amount of grass that he gets in the springtime. And, and that would be my, my main point of focus with a horse like that, really. Um, it's quite tempting when the grass starts coming through. It's a lot easier to chuck them out in the grass and leave them to it. But... Um, some of these horses really do need managed. Okay, hopefully that was good enough for you. <laughs> Perfect, thanks Vicky. Uh, and a question for Gillian. Um, I know I tried to tap in there, maybe felt a bit silly, but it did seem to do a bit of difference. Um, so we've got someone else here who's feeling really anxious. Um, is this a good way to fight off nerves as well as working against aches and pains? Oh, absolutely. That's that was the whole point. I just I use the aches and pains tonight really just because it's it's something easy to do. But it's absolutely for anxiety and stress and worry, grief, chronic pain. It's useful for all sorts of things, but really helpful for anxiety. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I think I'd just like to. Uh, end tonight and close up tonight. Uh, say thanks again to our speakers with Vicky Glasgow, Mark Quinn, and Gillian Watt. Um, I think we'll, we'll, as I say, everything will be available again for you to view. Um, we'll maybe put a link up for Gillian.